special guest today uh, from the electrical engineering, electrical computer engineering department. So um, we have uh, today we have Ben Johnson who is who's coming coming in to speak, and he's going to be talking again about some of his work in bioelectronic medicine. Um, he uh, he received his PhD from Cornell University, and then um, after that he did some uh, work as a research scientist at the University of uh, California Berkeley. And, um, and then, I guess he moved from, at, at, at some point, I don't know, was it <laughs> at the same time as uh, you were the director of technology then, at that point? Uh, that's why I originally went out to California. Yeah. Oh, okay, so maybe that was, that was before the Berkeley. Yeah. Okay, so also was and still is the director of technology at Forterra Neurotechnologies, where he leads the technical efforts to develop therapeutic devices for neurological disorders. So he's got an a, a interesting uh, perspective on, uh, from a, you know, a little bit different from mechanical um, and biomedical side of things, but now we have electrical engineering uh, approach to uh, biomedical engineering. So I think we're having a really interesting presentation. And I just learned he's from Boise, so which is right. kind of cool. <laughs> he's a native. He's a native. So uh, so welcome to uh, Dr. Johnson. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction. And um, I guess despite my urging to do so, today's talk isn't about why electrical engineering is better than mechanical. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you've never heard that one before. Uh, but really, this is bioelectronic medicine. And uh, there, there have been better words, I think, coined for it, but we're not always allowed to use them. And one of those is electroceuticals. Um, you know, kind of like how you have pharmaceuticals, right? You use these pharmacological agents to go and, and treat some type of uh, disease or symptom. Uh, this new wave of medicine, not so new, but uh, new emphasis, is that you use these electronic devices to actually modulate nerves or brain tissue in your body to, to treat these diseases. So uh, today's talk is about bioelectronic medicine and then uh, some of my specific efforts related to furthering that field. Um, so a brief little outline. Uh, I'll try to keep it short. I'll look, yeah, only three things. Um, yeah, so bioelectronic medicine, give you an overview of the past, present, and future. Um, and then we'll talk about um, stem dust, which is uh, kind of creating a really tiny, tiny little uh, peripheral nerve stimulator um, that's powered by ultrasound. And then in the waiting moments, I'll talk about WAN, uh, which is a wireless artifact-free neuromodulation device. Uh, I'll take input on the name on that, too, if you have suggestions. Um, but that one is just a quick demonstration of how can we kind of record and stimulate from the brain at the same time. Uh, so why should we care about uh, bioelectronic medicine, and in particular, uh, all these diseases around us? Well, uh, one way to perhaps quantify the effect of these diseases is to look at uh, dailies or dollies. I'm not sure what the pronunciation really is. But those are disability-adjusted life years. So in other words, um, for a given disease, how many years of life does that take off, right? Either due to premature death or due to some type of disability. And if we look at all these other disorders um, across the spectrum, what we see is neuropsychiatric disorders actually account for almost 20% of the dallies in the U.S. Or to put it another way, if we think of it in terms of a financial or economic burden that we face, uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's alone, the two most prominent neurodegenerative diseases, together are close to or over $250 billion. Right? And even those are kind of hard to quantify. Um, those are largely estimated, but it's really hard to estimate the indirect costs of these diseases. Because one, uh, if you get these diseases, maybe you can no longer work, so you lose income. But also maybe uh, a spouse or some other loved one or friend has to stop working as well to take care of you. And so the economic burden of these are really severe. Um, and I always kind of reference it to my own field, integrated circuits. Like worldwide, I think that's only about 270 billion. So uh, in terms of just the, these diseases in the US, it is quite significant. Um, and just to quantify it maybe a different way, um, we have about uh, 5 million people in the US with Alzheimer's, about a million with Parkinson's. Um, I think the prevalence is greater than 10% in those over 65 for both of these. So the question is, is can bioelectronic medicine improve patient outcomes? Uh, and this is kind of a MacGuffin. Of course, the answer is yes. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be speaking you, to you today. Uh, and so I want to start off with kind of the most, I think, dramatic example 
uh, at least that I've seen. Um, so here's a video of a guy named Andrew Johnson, no relation. Um, I think he's in Australia or Britain. Uh, but he has Parkinson's, and he was diagnosed at a very young age. I think he was 35. Um, so it can afflict kind of younger people. I think 35 is still young. Uh, Michael J. Fox, for example, I think was 29 when he was first diagnosed. Um, and so uh, one thing to keep in mind here is that when you try to treat this with traditional uh, pharma, uh, usually it takes about two years to get the dosage right. And then you have what's called the honeymoon period, where from three to five years, you, you kind of have things worked out. You know, you've got your routine down, you've got your medication down, and things are good. But then after that, um, it's no longer very effective. And so for somebody who's diagnosed at a very young age, it's very important to have some other avenue by which they can receive symptomatic treatment of the disease. Because he could be living with this condition for a very, very long time. Um, so I'm going to show you two quick videos. One. Uh, where he has this implanted device, you'll see him turn it off, and then you'll immediately see his symptoms. So here he's turning the, his stimulator off, he has these electrodes in his brain, and immediately you can see him start to shake as he's trying to show uh, the device is off. Uh, you can see him try to hold his hands up, uh, and he's actually pretty good natured about this. Uh, he says, well, I can, I can shake a good cocktail with my right, and then I'm doing the roll away with the left. Uh, <laughs> All right, and now, uh, eventually in the video, he's like, I have to turn it back on before I can no longer do so. And so you see here, here, he's turning the device back on, and immediately, uh, you can kind of see him take that sigh of relief, and now for the true test, what do his hands do? Straight out. Um, so here you see kind of immediate action of this electrical stimulator that is stimulating his brain to reduce his symptoms. And one other thing to note is that in that previous video, this guy is also on medication. And, and he says he's due for it uh, during the video, but do keep in mind if he takes those, uh, his L-DOPA, that it's still going to take half an hour or an hour before it's actually effective. Um, so I give that as an example of um, bioelectronic medicine. I think it's actually been around for quite some time. Um, this was a deep brain stimulator, so he's got this um, pulse generator implanted in his chest. These leads run up through his neck, uh, through a bore, and then electrodes go through this borehole in his skull, deep into the brain subdominant nucleus, and where it kind of zaps, and it actually produces that symptomatic effect. Um, of course, everyone's probably heard of pacemakers. It's probably the original bioelectronic medicine that's uh, still widely used today to kind of regulate heart rhythm. Um, there's also vagus nerve stimulators. I think those are fairly new. Um, I don't know a lot about those, but I, I asked my uh, my wife, who's an emergency uh, vet veterinarian, and she's like, "Oh yeah, so one thing you see, like, if some animal is going into some type of cardiac arrest or has some irregular heartbeat, um, one thing she would do is she pushes on their eyeballs to um, generate this vagus nerve response, and it will actually kind of reset the body." Right, so. Uh, just to be clear, don't take medical advice from me. Don't go home and push on your eyeballs if you want to change your heart rate. Um, but that's just kind of the precedent is that uh, there are actually these means to, to generate these, these nerve responses, and now we're just making it kind of more precise and more targeted. Because uh, I can't imagine pushing your eyeballs is a good way to do it. Uh, and then also, uh, these ones are fairly new. Um, spinal cord stimulators for chronic pain conditions. So there's a a strip of electrodes kind of implanted along your spine that will stimulate and alleviate your pain. So what do these devices actually look like? And, and you'll probably notice some similarities right away. They all kind of have that traditional pacemaker looking design. Uh, and for the most part, it's dominated by the battery. Right? So they have to be able to store enough charge to stimulate for a long time, uh, many, many years. There are some that are rechargeable, but for the most part, patients don't like those. Uh, and also, there's some liability, right? It's not like if you get to charge your phone overnight, it might die. If this, you have to always remember to charge your medical device. So that does um, that does mean there's some liability with many of these devices if they use rechargeable systems. So the question is, what is kind of the next generation you want to look like? Uh, this is a graphic I didn't make it. Um, 
But the idea is like, well, okay, we want to go from these kind of big bulky systems to something that's maybe the size of a grain of rice, such that we can easily implant it and put it right where we need it, and we'll do what it needs to do. Uh, in terms of people doing this, this is very um, somewhat early stage, but there's a lot of um, kind of, I would say, intellectual energy and money invested into solving these problems. Um, either through DARPA, the electrics program, or Galvani, Bioelectronics, um, which is a combination of Google, who you've probably heard of, and uh, GlaxoSmithKline, it's a joint venture by them, uh, to generate these kind of next generation bioelectronic devices. Um, and, and really the key thing to note here is that you're trying to generate, create something that's miniaturized, so maybe millimeter scale, uh, and that's deeply implanted in the tissue deliver targeted treatment. Uh, why are we doing that? Well, some advantages versus traditional pharma. Um, it is one, you can deliver targeted therapy. Um, and you can do it with, in theory, fewer side effects. Right? Because uh, one thing to note, for example, with Parkinson's medication, is that if you take too much, you actually get very similar symptoms to, to the disease itself. You get radiation, so locking up of the body. Um, so if we could perhaps prevent that by using electrical stimulation, that would be fantastic. Um, and it's also immediately effective, right? You saw that video. Um, if you try to do that with pharma, it would be like, take these and then wait for that kind of half-life or whatever to cycle through and then try it again, right? So those are long iteration cycles, right? Like I said earlier, it takes two years to do that. Um, maybe another data point is, uh, there's a company called Nevro making the spinal cord stimulator, and I think, I assume this is public knowledge, but I don't know, um, is that when you go and you get the implant, so they, they slip the electrodes, the strip of electrodes um, on your spine, I think T6 or something, uh, and there's six electrodes on there, and after the surgery you're up, and they start to program it, but the person who does the programming is actually the salesperson, right? So they're not actually a traditionally trained uh, you know, nurse or doctor, it's just some guy who, who you know, went through the company brochure and it's like, oh, okay, this is what I have to do. Um, because it is that immediate and drastic in terms of what it can do. And he just basically has to, he or she has to iterate through the pairs of electrodes, right? So one and two, okay, that didn't work, let's try two and three, let's try three and four, and so on. And, and they can do it right there, right after the surgery, to see if it worked or not. So it's immediately effective. Uh, and one other thing, if we have time, I'll talk a little bit about closed loop therapy. Um, and one thing I've found is that lots of people have different definitions of closed loop, so perhaps be interested in hearing what um, some, of you, how you, some of you guys define closed loop. But uh, uh, for me, I guess more on the device side, closed loop is to say like, um, you know, an insulin pump or something, right, you detect, you know, you, you monitor blood sugar, you decide whether to deliver something. Um, so neuroscientists and neurobiologists are more like, it has to be something behavioral, like you take something out of the loop and now you're, you're fixing the loop that you've created. Uh, but for the most part, I mean it from the device perspective. That, um, in other words, you can, you can monitor when the patient is symptomatic and then only deliver therapy then. Because uh, current deep brain simulation is just zapping all the time. Right? It's never changing, never modulating. Um, and, it has to, and there's no real um, quantified input to change therapy. All right, that sounds great, but in reality there's a lot of challenges in making this a reality. Um, so one thing we have to make systems very, very small, which is inherently challenging. Um, we have to be able to precisely control them. Uh, so one, you make them really tiny, and then you want an entire um, kind of control system and intelligence in there uh, to stimulate properly. And then the other issue, um, perhaps the largest technical barrier, is the ability to um, have enough power. So one thing when you're shrinking down to a grain of rice, you're almost inherently assuming my system is now batteryless. Right? So until we can, say, harvest from, I don't know, fat tissue or something, that means we have to pump, wire in from the, uh, pump uh, power in from the outside, harvest it, and use that deliver the therapy, uh, which that gets harder and harder the smaller and smaller you make it. 
Um, and then lastly, to do kind of true closed loop, you need to be able to stimulate and record at the same time. Um, so that's kind of like uh, somebody next to you shouting on, on a megaphone and then being able to hear another person next to you whisper, all right? Uh, because biological signals are very small, these stimulation events are quite large, um, so that is an active area of research. So to help motivate STEM dust, I just want to give an overview of kind of the state of the art, where, where things are at. Uh, most, none of these are more than two, I guess it's three years old. Um, so here's one kind of a uh, traditional path. It's just kind of this little pill. Somebody put a coil in it, so it picks up, um, that uses inductive charging. Um, but I don't know how much you know about circuits, but you can look at it, and it's actually not that well controlled. So it's going to be very sensitive to uh, receive power, um, it's going to be a pure voltage, that means it's going to be uh, sensitive to what type of electrodes and their impedance. Uh, and so there's really no um, precise control with the system, but it is very small, yet also inefficient. Um, so here's work um, from Stanford and the Ada Poons group. Uh, this is um, a little bit deeper in. So the other one's inductive, which is really limited to by range. Kind of maybe go through the skin, but you're not going to go deep in the tissue. Uh, this one uses something, I think they've called it midfield. So not far field, near field, it's midfield. Um, and they're kind of figuring out how to squeeze every kind of last ounce of, of wireless power here. Um, but once again, they kind of use these off the shelf components, kind of assemble them in this little tight uh, package, glob them up, uh, and so it that way. But in terms of the kind of circuits and controls, it's very similar to the previous one where you're also sensitive to receive power and your electrode impedance. Um, and then one other example, so these are kind of three different types of wireless power, is using ultrasound. Uh, so they use a piezo crystal, right? You hit it with an ultrasonic wave that generates some electricity. Um, but on this one, they're, they're basically just harvesting that electricity and using that to directly stimulate. Um, so it has some advantages, it has much better efficiency, but um, there's still really no control over it. It's still very sensitive to receive power and electrode impedance. So I guess firstly, uh, kind of compare, I want to compare RF to ultrasonic power. Uh, and why do we see such an advantage uh, with ultrasound inside the body? Uh, so with this work here, this is a little uh, chiplet, uh, about a millimeter square, and they can harvest about five microwatts. Um, once again, these are these are just demonstrated numbers, nothing fundamental, fundamentally derived here. Um, however, another system uh, around the same time uh, uses ultrasound, and they can harvest uh, about 350 microwatts. All right, they weren't even trying to optimize or maximize that. That's just what they were able to do with a similarly sized system. How do they achieve that higher, higher power? Uh, well, first of all, the FDA intensity limit for ultrasound is much higher than it is for RF. Right? Uh, by about a factor of 72. Part of the reason that is is because you have far less um, absorption of ultrasound than you do with RF. Right? So it's kind of like you put a big hunk of steak in the microwave, and maybe a hot pocket, you guys are college students. Um, What's happen? What's going to happen when you take it out? It'll be hot on the outside, right? It'll burn you. And then on the inside, it's going to be ice cold. Uh, why is that? Because you have a skin depth, right? And it, a lot of it gets absorbed at the surface, doesn't penetrate all the way through. Um, so when we think about powering a device in, inside of us, it's the same exact thing. A lot of it's going to get absorbed by the skin and not pass as deeply as we want it to. Uh, one other thing is that it has a much shorter wavelength. Uh, and so, uh, so the first order, the, your ability to harvest power is proportional to the wavelength, uh, or the size of your antenna, um, I think I can say. Uh, so in other words, if you have a long wavelength, you need a long antenna. So if you have a short wavelength, you need a shorter antenna. So now you have kind of a smaller receiving element that can couple more efficiently. Uh, one other um, advantage of ultrasound is that you can focus um, ultrasonic power kind of uh, like you can optically, you just use a lens and focus it to a single point. Um, so that means you can do a bunch of different things. Um, you have higher available power, um, you have higher efficiency 
you have safer power transfer overall. And then uh, with this focusing, you can also do some spatial multiplexing. Right? So um, maybe the, the long vision is that you can have multiple of these devices in the body, and you can kind of use this external unit to target different units um, that are implanted. Um, so without further ado, here is the system we've been working on. Um, I guess hopefully you mechanical engineers don't judge me too much for my CAD drawings. Um, so it consists of a piezo crystal, so this converts uh, acoustical energy to electrical energy. Uh, and there's a simulation IC, so this is the brains of the system. So it'll uh, convert AC power to DC and then determine when to stimulate and with how much current. Uh, there's a capacitor for energy storage. Uh, and then also we have a brief mention to the electrodes, which um, one thing to note, uh, this isn't just about IC design. I think in terms of the entire solution, this is a systems level problem. Um, and all of these things have to be engineered together to, to maximize performance. Uh, so overall, we can kind of achieve the smallest volume of any of those devices. Uh, we have much higher efficiency. Um, so a lot of those other ones I had to estimate. I think they might actually be far worse than I estimated, because I was giving them the benefit of the doubt. Um, but in terms of our efficiency, it's the amount of power delivered by stimulation versus the amount of power uh, received. Um, we also stimulate with a precise current. And then we can also perform uh, telemetry. So we have some backscatter readout. Uh, so this, this is the device's way of telling the external unit when it's stimulating and when it's not. Right, so uh, some quick background on stimulation is uh, most of these neural electrodes are, are nerve electrodes. You can model as kind of R's and C's based on this double layer capacitance, and spread resistance, and whatnot. Um, so what that means is, as you push a current through them, right, the voltage goes up. You have an IR drop, and then I equals uh, C D P. Uh, so things charge up. But then also note that uh, we're now batteryless, so we just have charge storage on the capacitor. So we're also draining that at the same time. Uh, so the key problem here is how do you make sure that we have enough uh, voltage for a given current. Um, and that actually comes through engineering the electrodes the right way. Is if you use, say, a standard gold or perhaps platinum electrodes, those actually have a higher impedance. And you can use, um, so people doing materials research have developed something called P.PSS, which actually has a significantly lower uh, impedance. It basically just looks like that resistor. Um, and the advantage of that is that we can use a much lower voltage when we stimulate. So it's the same exact uh, current, so the same intensity. We're just wasting uh, less power. So that has multiple benefits uh, straight off right in the stimulation. And then also, we don't have to put, um, say, charge pumps in the chip, which also lose efficiency, right? Because you get 2 volts, so we have to pump it up to 10. Um, so that's going to hurt our efficiency. So there are several advantages. And then we can use a low voltage kind of CMOS process, so it's cheaper and more available. So it has a ton of benefits just by kind of solving this issue um, at a systems level rather than just at a plain circuits level. Uh, in terms of what the system does, is it uses the external ultrasound protocol to deliver precise stimulation charge. Right? Uh, so after a power-up sequence, there's a gap. Uh, and the length of that gap programs an amplitude for stimulation. Uh, so rather than being dependent on the received power, uh, and then we can precisely control the pulse width and the gap and the period just by kind of uh, altering our protocol by you know, you know, leaving the ultrasound longer or, or shortening it, um, and we can deliver different simulation patterns. So overall, we have low latency simulation, and we have timing precision without an on-chip block. Um, so just to be clear, is if, if we want to hit kilohertz, but we also want to hit millihertz or something less, um, if you had to divide down this megahertz clock, right, you'd be burning so much power just dividing that down on chip, right? You could no longer hit all of these efficiency numbers. Um, so here's an overall architecture of the chip. Uh, I'll, I'll walk through this as uh, about as gently as I can. Um, it's not an insult to you guys. It's just <laughs> uh, so input ultrasound powers up the implant. Uh, and then there's a, a power on reset, which will initialize the system, looks at a state. Uh, 
then this gap um, will trigger a time to digital converter. So in other words, the, um, the amount of time that's on will be converted to a digital code. And that digital code will code the amplitude of stimulation. Uh, and then there's, uh, when the next packet or burst of ultrasound comes in, um, that will turn on a lot of circuitry, so a lot of um, analog current sources. And the reason we do this is because kind of the key here is we heavily duty cycle. We only turn things on when we need it. And that's how we achieve these high efficiencies. Um, so that turns on, everything settles, and then this next kind of bit, we actually start to stimulate. So uh, we, we program an amplitude. That sets the amount of current that goes from our simulation electrode to our sink. Uh, and then there's also kind of a switch uh, on the piezo terminal, which I'll talk a little bit about a few more slides. Uh, that will modulate the backscatter and tell the external system that we're simulating. And then there's an interface gap in which the chip really does nothing. This is more for biological purposes. Um, I think there's been some work shown that uh, the duration of this gap will affect simulation thresholds. Um, so one thing we wanted to do was uh, kind of leave a, an adjustability option in there for kind of researchers to use. And then the next packet um, kind of recharges the whole system and it also shorts the simulation electrode, uh, returning it back to baseline to ground. Right, uh, and quickly, a few measurement results because in the integrated circuit world, like you can design all you want, but if you don't show measurements, it doesn't count. Um, so, so here we see that we can you know, change the gap of the ultrasound packets and that will set the amplitude. Uh, and then we can also achieve a very high uh, chip efficiency when we have high simulation currents. So we might say, oh, you have poor efficiency for low stimulation. That is true, but then you don't, it doesn't matter as much because you don't need as much overall power. Uh, and also some pinch top data. Uh, so the blue is the piezo terminal, and then the red is the voltage supply in this one, uh, and then the yellow, orange, whatever color that is, is the voltage across the electrode. And, and so what this is showing is that you can kind of do on-the-fly programming, like we claim, and that you can also kind of hit a high dynamic range of stimulation frequencies. So in theory, we could hit you know, millihertz or we can hit kilohertz. Uh, so now a little bit about um, backscatter. So uh, the way this works is that you have this external um, transducer, which will send ultrasound waves. Um, it will hinge upon your piezo crystal. And the amount that backscatters is actually proportional to the electrical load seen by your motor. All right. So, in other words, uh, in other words, the, the resistor across the piezo, you change that, and it changes how much uh, gets reflected back. Right? Uh, and so that's what we were doing with that switch earlier. So the green is kind of the switch off. The teal blue thing is when the switch is on. Um, and so you can see here that we can change. Um, kind of the load on that piezo quite a bit by changing that switch. You can't change it too much, otherwise you just short everything out. Um, and the goal here was to match it to the um, series resistance of the piezo at resonance. Uh, and so the key here is that we get kind of maximal uh, difference between the two states by changing that impedance. So we have some form of readout or safety to know that our device is stimulated. You know, in terms of the in vivo uh, setup, uh, we use an external microcontroller to generate all the waveforms. So very simple, it's just a square wave, and then uh, sometimes you zero it out to kind of create those dead periods of the ultrasound. Uh, and then you have to drive it at somewhat of a high voltage, so I think normally we operate it at 25 volts. Uh, and then in terms of the kind of biological prep, we put our, our device, we cuffed it to the sciatic nerve of the rat. Um, and the idea there is that once you stimulate the sciatic nerve, we can induce some type of a muscular twitch, which we can then record using EMG electrodes that are stuck right at the leg of the rat. Um, oh, forgot to warn people. Um, there will be animal pictures. Um, sorry. Uh, so here's a picture of the test setup that looks uh, kind of messy, but. You can see the, the external transducer, um, and we try to get a nice one where you can actually see the moat there sitting on the nerve. Uh, we have gotten some criticisms like, well, this means it's not implanted, but it's like, 
we show you a picture of it implanted, then you can't see it, so. Um, and then also, hopefully, uh, this will be clear too. Yes, it is going through ultrasound gel, but the purpose of the gel is to be uh, a tissue phantom, right? That's, that's its purpose, is to um, acoustically match uh, between the tissue, yeah, from tissue to the um, interface. Uh, so this is kind of the setup. And then there's a video, one more warning, sorry. Uh, is you can see here, the, the ultrasound is on, and we can actually generate a regular uh, one hertz twitch in the leg as we control the mode. Okay, so one last little in vivo picture. This is a picture of the moat uh, on the sciatic nerve. Uh, and then these are the different voltages that we recorded just to show that it's working across the different modes. So you can see it has sort of that charging of the capacitor mostly looks uh, fairly resistant because of our VR electrodes. Uh, and then in terms of EMG, uh, you can see it twitching, but we actually want to quantify that. Uh, is you can actually record an EMG response from the leg. Um, so we do that for all these different amplitudes, and then you see we can generate this kind of nice textbook sigmoidal curve of, um, of recruitment for the, uh, the nerve. Because um, one question we get is, well, how do you know you're not just stimulating the nerve directly with your ultrasound? Uh, because people do uh, stimulate with ultrasound directly, but I think the thresholds are about 10 to 100 times higher. Uh, and, and furthermore, you wouldn't get this kind of change in response, because if you think about the ultrasound power delivered to the system, it's fairly constant for all these states. Uh, and in fact, it's actually even slightly higher for the low current state, because the TDC gap is shorter. So, uh, so what have we done? We've, we've, we've shown an ultrasonically powered mode. Um, and we've done it at this depth because that's just the depth of focal depth of our transducer. Um, it's really harder to get much deeper in a rat. Um, we've shown uh, high chip efficiency uh, for high, uh, high stem currents, and then that we can also do uh, kind of defined and well control uh, stimulation parameters. Uh, so I think, really think that this is the, uh, the stepping stone to next generation uh, bioelectronic medicine. And Obviously, this slide needs some work, but in terms of our future directions, um, we've already uh, taped out another chip that has a much smaller area, uh, and then we're also going to look into creating systems that can sense and stem at the same time. Uh, not, that's not only a challenge kind of at the electrode level, but also in terms of reading out the ultrasound. It's quite tricky. And then we're also uh, moving to multiple uh, channels. So, uh, that has kind of two meanings. So, uh, one, either having multiple modes uh, in the body, or having multiple electrodes attached to a single mode. Uh, because sometimes, say on the nerve, you want to activate it and then stimulate uh, different electrodes on the nerve uh, to activate different areas. Um, and of course, always, always an issue is chronic packaging. So, um, right now, we've encapsulated everything in perylene, which is nice and thin, um, but that's really just a short-term solution, and, and it's not going to work for something that we want to work for. Um, we definitely outlive a human being, uh, but it'd be nice you know, to get even years or decades out of it. Uh, final shout out to my team. You probably know none of these people, but uh, uh, they were helpful nonetheless. So this is a, just to make it clear, this is a, a giant collaborative effort um, between kind of ECE professors and biomedical engineering, um, because you have to wear lots of hats to actually get a system like this to, to function completely. Uh, so finally, uh, I just want to kind of conclude with uh, some other work I've been working on. Uh, and that's the, uh, the idea of simultaneous recording and stimulation. Uh, so it's a little bit more of a directed medical application. Uh, so I start off with this kind of key example to demonstrate the problem. It's uh, uh, NeuroPace RNS. It's, this is the device to treat um, epileptics. And so the way it works is, you know, it'll be sensing activity, uh, and then it'll measure the seizure, right? It sees this kind of oscillatory activity. 
once it does that, you know, it, it does an F of T and puts the power, and then it starts to stimulate. Um, however, one thing when it does that, uh, and I even kind of show it and admit it, uh, they're no longer able to sense, right, because they are stimulating. So, in terms of a, a true closed loop, they can't really titrate therapy. Like, oh, I see that this is reducing the seizure. They just kind of have to assume, okay, we're going to zap for a long time and hope that that's good enough. Um, and you know, in this case, oh, it is. So now it begins to recover and it can start recording or sensing again. Um, so really, our objective is how do we kind of shorten um, this recovery time? Can we get simultaneous or virtually simultaneous or near simultaneous uh, from co-located electrodes? Uh, so our uh, final vision, uh, which has changed slightly from this, but we like the figure, uh, don't want to make it, uh, is that there's a central kind of hub uh, that, that is much smaller, right? We're replacing kind of deep brain stimulator that is something that's implanted in the chest, but to go maybe just under the skull or on top of the skull, um, which will process to, um, and control the systems, and then it will fan out to kind of multiple um, smart electrodes. So in each little kind of circular thing there, that can control um, either uh, an ECOG electrode or some type of subcortical uh, depth electrode. Uh, so most of my work was devoted to creating uh, an IC that can both record and simulate uh, at the same time. Uh, won't talk a whole lot about how I did it. Um, and then the next thing we did is to actually demonstrate this, you know, despite, um, you know, even if we had a willing human volunteer, we still legally wouldn't be allowed to do it in a human to try it out. Um, so we actually do it in uh, non-human primates. So uh, that's where the system wand came about, is we use a couple of our, our ICs that we developed, uh, kind of combine it with an FPGA, uh, and then actually deploy it onto a microdrive. So it's this kind of housing that is implanted into um, on the head of a, of a monkey, and then these depth electrodes can be adjusted uh, to record and stimulate from the brain. Uh, so, for example, that can't show. It. I'm not allowed to show you monkey pictures. Um, I can't even tell you where I did this. Uh, it was at Berkeley, but I can't tell you the exact address. Uh, it's all secret, and I couldn't find it for a long time. And yeah, anyway. Uh, so here's just kind of some example of recording data. We're recording um, LFP, local field potentials, um, from the uh, cortex of the monkey. Um, and really what we wanted to do was show this in some type of a closed loop or behavioral experiment. Uh, so in this case, the monkey, his name is Mario, is uh, trained to control a joystick. Um, and that controls a, a cursor on a computer screen. And what happens is he has to kind of move it to the center and then he's given a cue. It's like, okay, you're about to get a target. It'll appear in one of, I think, eight spots on the screen, and he has to move this cursor to the right spot. And so from there, you can measure a bunch of things like reaction time, and we can look at you know, his cortical activity as he does it, as he's moving, as he's thinking. Um, so those are some of the things that we want to look at. Um, you can, in fact, even measure him getting the juice reward. Uh, so the juice is key, because uh, Mario does not work for free. He has to do it for juice. And so you'll be in there, um, he'll be doing the experiments, all of a sudden he'll stop. Why does he stop? Oh, he must be out of juice, right? He'll do it once or twice after it, but then he's like, okay, like, you know, I, don't, I don't play for no pay, right? Um, and so what we see here is that we can actually correlate his data activity uh, during these different steps. So while he's preparing to move the whole time, uh, the beta power actually drops as he's moving. Um, and then you can actually see the beta power shoot up once he gets this reward, right? He gets a rush of dopamine and he says, yeah, I'm excited, I completed my task. Um, and so that's the recording. Um, in terms of uh, the simultaneous uh, recording stimulation, I just want to give a brief treatment of that. Is, uh, so you have to kind of co-design the stimulation, the recording, and then also the back-end processing. Uh, so here's kind of an example, is you see once we stimulate, um, and despite our best efforts to bring this down from volts, we still kind of have maybe millivolts of artifact. Uh, and then if you look at the FFT, this is on the right, uh, it completely kind of pollutes the spectrum. Right? In this case, what we really want to look at is beta power, so around uh, 20 hertz. Um, 
so that's an example without simulation. Um, however, one thing you might notice is like, well, we can actually use a variety of kind of backend techniques to actually improve this. Uh, so in this case, we used um, a multi-channel uh, principal component analysis, kind of removed this common mode of noise from each of these channels, and we can kind of restore the spectrum. Uh, we've even gotten maybe better results, even more efficient results at least, uh, just by interpolating over that kind of little spike that we get. Right, because the advantage of this, our system, is that we immediately recover after we stimulate. Uh, and just kind of to wrap things up and to do some uh, shameless self promotion, if you want to learn more about this, uh, check out uh, my review paper, which actually just published yesterday. Uh, and then you can read more about the IC or the system. Uh, uh, and of course, there are links to those on, on my uh, research website. So uh, with that, I will conclude. I want to thank all of you for, for braving, braving the, the snow and coming out here uh, to hear me speak. So thank you. Thank you. All right, we have time for some questions. Not everybody at once. Yeah. So you said you felt like your chip was about 80% efficient. Um, you feel like that's kind of the limit of the crystal, or can you improve the uh, Yeah, so I guess um, here's the, you lose efficiency every step along the way. So that's about the limit of the efficiency of the chip, is, is kind of 80%. 80, 80 um, you know, maybe we can get mm, close to 90, but that's really hard. Yeah. But uh, the piezo crystal itself is probably about 50% efficient. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then you also have the efficiency of the link, uh, which is also very low. So that's why, so that you can yeah, and all of these things kind of cascade together, so you want to maximize all of them, uh, but that's kind of the only parameter I can control right now is the check. Right. Yeah. I, I was wondering, if, when you have this electrode in the planet, as the physiological conditions change, is there I mean, the impedance is going to change. Do you, does the, the circuit have to self tune to account for that difference, or is it? Uh, yeah, so I guess, um, I guess maybe there's two ways to, to answer that. It's either, I guess, with the peripheral nerve case, like, you have to be worried about things moving. That's one concern. Uh, yeah. um, so that's one <laughs> nice thing with the nerve, is like the leg is moving, but the nerve is not. Um, but also with the kind of brain, um, the brain electrodes is that you will have uh, something called like glial scar formation over the electrodes because the body is going to try to reject this implant. Um, there's some there's some evidence that says that well, uh, if you stimulate, it kind of prevents it or delays it, or if you make things small enough, it's kind of in this invisibility window that you can avoid blocking this glial scar. In. But that is one reason I think why um, uh, even the electrical stimulation in the case of uh, of deep brain stimulation, they have to adapt it over time because it's a, prog a, degenerate, it's a progressive disease um, and the body does change, right? It has plasticity and then... Uh, Dehydration. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is why it's so important to get something close to it because, uh, you know, with, with pharma, like, your, your, your medication may not be effective if you had, like, eggs for breakfast. Right? Like, your dose just doesn't work. So that's why we kind of need these quantified feedback loops uh, for effective treatment. Question in the back. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, <clears throat> currently, um, how long does your device operate without having to be ultrasonically recharged? Uh, so, so right now, um, the the little implant device it is continuously powered. Um, so that's one thing I didn't go into great detail is, uh, and the reason we do that is to get kind of low latency, <laughs> is we want to be able to stand right away. Uh, but there is another kind of method to operate it, which is um, you do have to kind of charge it up. In that case, um, the latency is just a few more milliseconds because you have to charge up that external cap and then it will stimulate and then shut it off. Um, so that's maybe another way to measure efficiency is like, well, if I want, like how much can I duty cycle it? And I guess the answer is you can very, very heavily duty cycle the system to make it efficient. Uh, yeah, very nice talk. Um, I was just, I came late, so I might have missed the answer. Um, 
you said the um, to drive the system use ultrasound, right? And yeah. You had the gel. So how if this becomes implanted, how do you envision that ultrasound actually reaching to the place that it needs to go? Yeah. So I guess in terms of its eventual deployment is uh, the the people who are kind of working more on that end. Um, what they're starting to work on are kind of arrays. So like maybe you put on like a sleeve, which will have a whole array of little ultrasonic transducers, mm -hmm. and then that will figure out how to kind of power the device. And then I think there the active problem is actually, um, can you do it without gel, or um, can you like rely on inherent like moisture or sweat and skin to do it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had a question. Well, I, mean, I may have missed this a little bit, so I want to make sure. So you're you're powering the chip, um, and, it's, and it's stimulating the nerve. And can you, can you describe a little bit about how that exact stimulation occurs? Is it a voltage, or is it uh, let's see, how does that? Yeah, how does that actually occur? Yeah. So um, yeah, I didn't really give uh, a background to kind of neural stimulation, but it's, uh, you can do it with either voltage or current. Um, and typically, uh, for most clinical things and I guess research. Uh, you want to do current because uh, what really matters is delivered charge. And so if you use a current, right, the whole, whole charge is this kind of I times T. Um, so it's really precise, it's a known quantity. Whereas if you use a voltage, the amount of charge that's delivered is dependent on all of the electrode properties. And so even though you're applying one volt, you really have no idea how much charge you're delivering. So uh, that's kind of one kind of key aspect is this, of this is that we're actually doing current stimulation where all those other systems are doing voltage. Thank you. A question? Just a question. Uh, with the current thing, so I saw that it was to the order of microns, typically. What is the uh, human brain or a nerve typically operating at without your simulation? Um, as far as electrical current goes. Yeah. So those, those currents are, in terms of currents, they're very small. So um, I guess the way to think of of currents in the body is, you know, like in, in semiconductors, we have holes and electrons, but in the body, we have ions moving around. Um, and so in terms of, I guess, the, the voltage that you measure with an extracellular electrode, you're measuring usually microvolts. Um, so that's going to be, you know, pico nanoamps, I think. Uh, so tiny. And then, much, much lower than the Yeah, of but, and then once you're inside the cell, then it's going to be, you know, on the order of like um, 70 millivolts. So I think you see about a factor of, I guess, a thousand from inside versus outside the cell. Yeah. I guess you didn't ask this question, but I can tack on there too. Is, uh, for for deep brain stimulation, usually those stimulation currents are on the order of milliamps, um, whereas a lot of this nerve is uh, um, kind of order of microamps. Other questions? All right. Um, so you, uh, you're an electrical engineer by trains, is that correct? And then you got into this field, um, maybe, it's the, maybe it's a bit of a higher level, sort of, you know, how, what drew you to this and, and sort of how, how are you, how did you pick up the, the, the level of biological um, engineering, I guess, in this case, uh, that, that required for the work? Yeah, yeah, you know, so, um, it is, so try to keep it brief. <laughs> too much, but I think it was, I was an undergraduate at the time. I was watching a PBS special, um, and it was by this work done at Brown University, I think, or Duke, and, and or Duke, and the other uh, this research. Um, but it was a very similar thing where they had a monkey controlling a joystick. He's playing Space Invaders. Every time he shot an alien, he gets a juice reward. Um, and so what they were doing was like, can we actually decode the kind of you know the neural activity and figure out how I was doing it, right? It's like, oh, this is when he moves right, we have this, these spikes, he moves left, and up and down, which is the button. Um, and so what they did eventually is they disconnected the joystick from the computer and just used the neural code by itself. Um, and so they're still doing it, and the monkey's still playing, and then they, they have this like dramatic dun-dun-dun music is that the monkey actually figures out that the joystick isn't working, and you see him kind of like stretch, and he's still playing the game with his brain. I was like, oh, wow, I wouldn't have figured that out. Um, and so I saw that. I was like, oh, wow, that's really cool. I have to know more about this. And then, um, yeah, and then, uh, you know, going through grad school, I had to kind of do two fields at once. Yeah. I don't know if I recommend that. Uh, 
Um, but you can't really be half and half. You have to be both. both. That's or, you have to be both. Yeah. Well, that, that almost yeah. brings me to one more question, if you, want, if you don't mind. So, where does the future then? I mean, we're talking about. So, you just described a situation where a monkey was playing a video game with his mom. Mm -hmm. I mean, is, is that is that where this field is going? I mean, for you know, that down the road, twenty years, thirty years, that we're we're going to be, you know, we don't have cell phones anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think everyone kind of wants it to go that way, um, but it's it's been slow going because I think there are kind of lower hanging fruit that are less invasive. So this would probably be best for somebody who's like a, a quadriplegic, right, who's, who only has yeah. that. Um, and even then, some people, uh, I know some work at Georgia Tech, it's like, well, we don't need all this brain coding stuff. We can still use some type of coding with their tongue and have that control, you know, their wheelchair or something. Um, and, and I, I think, if anything, I, we will probably see some type of a compromise. Um, things may be slightly invasive, but not incredibly invasive. Because I remember it used to be a huge thing to like, oh, everyone's going to have RFID implants someday. Yeah. Right. You can use that to lock doors. But now, everyone has RFID implants, but they're just like in our ID cards. Right. So I think that was kind of a far better solution <laughs> than, you know, when you come to Boise State, you have to get this injection. <laughs> <laughs> like the dogs, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Ben. Uh, let's give him a, uh, another round of applause.